This is the nature of things. Sound has a kind of magic. Some creatures see with sound. And so do some blind people. Sound can be shaped and engineered to enhance beautiful music. Sound can even change the taste of food. Sound can burn away tumors and may soon treat Alzheimer's disease. Sound can levitate solid objects. The mysteries of sound are coming into focus like never before. Look at that geometry, oh my goodness. So many of us now plug into earbuds and headphones. We're moving to the sound of our own playlists, living in our own audio space. Yet at the same time, scientists are making fascinating discoveries about the sounds of the real world. So let's take a break from our buds and listen. When people try to explain what sound is, they often liken it to ripples in a pond a series of traveling compression waves radiating outward from the source. We can make a graph of sound. We can measure the level of sound. We can record the intensity of sound. But a real picture of sound is more complex. matter in surprising ways, a mystery that has recently deepened. Cymatics is the science of visible sound. So all we have is a metal plate and we sprinkle on some sand. What you see here is completely formless. In other words, there's no pattern at all. Then we take a violin bow and we're going to play the plate with the violin bow. You see a beautiful star appears on the plate. Now, that pattern that forms is basically the sound made visible, and it's kind of magic. And now watch what happens when we make this plate vibrate from an electronic piano. Isn't that neat? John Stuart Reed of Keswick, England, is the co-inventor of a new instrument called the cymoscope. It converts sound into three-dimensional geometric images in water. What's happening is the sound is actually compressing water molecules under the surface and actually creating a kind of lensing effect to allow light to bounce off those subsurface structures. So here you see that there's a pattern forming in the center. If I put my finger in, you can see what happens that it actually disturbs the pattern completely. The pattern's now gone, it's in, gone into chaos. If I take my finger out again and leave it for a second or two to restabilize, you can see that the pattern starts to come back again. So that's really interesting, isn't it? Here we have the beautiful song of a humpback whale. Some of this geometry that we're seeing is just exquisitely beautiful. When we look at some of the other cymoscope images, we are seeing so many forms that resemble early life forms in the ocean. The cymoscope may someday help us determine whether this is just a fascinating coincidence or new evolutionary biology. Sound has evolved into a primary alarm system because we can hear danger even before we see it. Lots of animals use the hearing to avoid being eaten. It serves a kind of an omnidirectional monitor for things that are happening in the environment. Sound is the sense that never sleeps. The brain listens even while you dream. If you're sleeping, you're not gonna be awakened by most sounds. 
Say, suppose you're attuned to the sound of a baby crying. That will wake you up because your brain has learned that that's something important for you and it will go right through whatever your defenses are to keep you asleep and you are awake. But sometimes, sound plays tricks on the brain, bouncing around, causing echoes and turning words to mush. Solving problems caused by sound is what acoustic engineer Trevor Cox does for a living. I did a physics degree and I was always a musician and it was a kind of a way of combining my interest in music and physics together. Cox records sound in odd spaces, here with a head-like device that mimics human hearing. I just got fascinated in how architecture changes music and enhances and beautifies it. Sometimes it's about making music beautiful, and other times it's about speech, it's about trying to communicate. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. And every At the town hall in Manchester, England, Cox explains the hearing problem caused by reverberation. In a big space like this, you have to talk slowly to make the speech intelligible. When I talk in the building, you don't just get the sound straight from my voice, you get the reflections off the floor, the walls and the ceiling. And each reflection arrives at the ears at a slightly different time. That amplifies my voice, and it's one of the reasons it's very easy to project your voice in a space like this. But it's not very good for speech, because the words start running into each other as the previous word lingers and mingles with the next one. It makes it a bit unintelligible. To hear an extreme example of this, go to Pisa, Italy, where there is a second, less famous tower called the Baptistry of St. John. Here, opera singers demonstrate some remarkable acoustics by singing notes that lingers so long in the air, a singer can harmonize with himself. a full nine seconds. Good acoustics are more than just entertainment. If the announcements in a train station, for example, are garbled, passengers might miss more than the Orient Express. You know, it's about life or death situation if someone's being evacuated because there's a fire or a bomb alert. So it's more than just being able to hear the announcements. Acoustic engineers in a studio like this in Manchester can clean up muddy speech by creating a computer model of the station and then tweaking the sound system or the building's acoustics. But we can use a much more directional loudspeaker which is aimed at the passengers and away from all the reflective surfaces in the room. If we add some sound absorbing treatments, and in this case it's to the soffit all along the top of the structure, hopefully much better intelligibility. The train approaching platform two is the 9.46 train to Milan. Will passengers for the 9.46 train to Milan... Please? For a theater or concert hall designer, sitting in the sweet spot of this lab provides the chance to hear what their building will sound like before it's built and compare it with some of the best acoustics in the world. I'm going to take you to the Boston Symphony Hall in the US. Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary... The secret of Symphony Hall's virtually perfect sound is in the math, the equation written in the 1890s by Harvard physicist Wallace Sabine. Using a pipe organ and a stopwatch, Sabine made thousands of measurements to calculate the ideal ratio between room volume and sound-absorbing materials. With a reverb time of 1.9 seconds, Symphony Hall is considered one of the top concert halls in the world, and the Sabine equation underlies the software that allows acoustic engineers Ping Chen and Gary Mack to fine-tune the sound of a modern performing arts center. They start by measuring the time it takes for sound to bounce off the walls and the ceiling, keeping in mind the ideal times for voice and music. They create a computer model of the soundscape what they call an oralization. 
the back walls below the balcony. That's going to be the longest reflections that we're trying to control. Which allows them to customize the way a room sounds, depending on what it's used for. Those acoustical panels, they're retractable. So for speech, we're going to have them in place. But for music, we're going to retract them because we really want the lateral reflections for music. So these reflectors mm -hmm. should probably be a little bit lower. A series of mobile panels converts this theater stage to a music venue in a matter of minutes. sound like it's supposed to sound. Sound has the capacity to charm, the power to annoy, and the ability to change history. The government gave up. They handed the keys to the palace, and they literally went home. People respond to sound in varying ways. Much depends on who's listening and what's making the sound. Usually the sounds of nature, even when loud, tend to be less annoying than the sounds of modern life. But how much is too much? A decibel meter measures the level of sound pressure. Normal conversation is roughly 60. Because the scale is logarithmic, 70 decibels is twice as loud. Hearing protection is recommended at 85. Above 90, sound is damaging. Prolonged exposure to noise at this level causes hearing loss. Pain begins at 125. Loud sound produces a fight or flight response. Stress, anxiety, increased heart rate, loss of sleep, fatigue, and social conflict have all been linked to louder environments. Psychologist Ellen Polyakov of the University of Manchester has studied how sound even affects the taste of food. For this experiment, we wanted to target specifically salty flavored foods and sweet foods. We asked participants to wear the headphones. So there was one condition where there was no noise at all, one where it was quiet, so this was 45 to 55 decibels, or louder noise, which was the 75 to 85 decibels. The participant would close their eyes, so they didn't know which of the foods was coming, and they would reach out and then they would eat it. People found that they rated the food less sweet and less salty in the presence of the background noise. This may explain why airline food often tastes bland. One theory is that high background noise prevents the brain from fully processing other sensory input. The white noise actually distracts you from processing the taste as much as you might otherwise do so. So it appears less strong to you because you're distracted. The volume of sound in cities everywhere is constantly changing. Sounds that used to be strong and clear are getting lost in the din of urban noise. So isn't that a great sound, right? Right in the center of Vancouver? Barry Truax is an emeritus professor of acoustic communication at Simon Fraser University. Truax believes that preservation of iconic sounds, or sonic landmarks, is just as important as preserving a city's visual landmarks. He and a team of researchers set out to measure how far away they can hear the bells of Holy Rosary Cathedral. His concern is that the roar of the street is drowning out the city's historic sounds. It really began in the early 1970s with a much more ambitious title, the World Soundscape Project. 
the Canadian composer R. Murray Schaefer, who taught at Simon Fraser University, decided that instead of being just anti-noise, that it would be much more positive to create a soundscape approach. which is sound marks as oral landmarks. And so first of all, it gets everybody thinking, well, what is a special? And there you have it, one of arguably the most unique sound mark in Canada. <laughs> first four notes of the national anthem, for almost 50 years now, that sound has become a part of the Vancouver soundscape and probably is the most recognizable one outside of Vancouver. What Murray Schaefer created with the World Soundscape Project was a whole new field of study called acoustic ecology. It's essentially an oral ethnography, right, that you actually understand society uh, like an anthropologist would, but using your ears and not just your eyes. These bells used to be heard all over town. Now, even if you listen carefully, even if you can still see the bell tower, the sound is lost after a few city blocks. So there you go, there's the difference between the acoustic world and the mechanical world. Half a block. A hundred years ago, they could talk about listening to the beautiful chimes of the Holy Rosary Cathedral in the Hillcrest area and also South Vancouver. You know how many miles away that is. A hundred years ago, Holy Rosary was one of the tallest buildings in the city. Today, it's lost in a concrete forest. If the ringing could be heard in Hillcrest, nearly 40 blocks away, then the acoustic profile of the bells has shrunk to less than a tenth of what it was. But this is only part of the story. The sound of city streets in Vancouver was entirely different a century ago. The only moving pictures from those days, shot from the front of a streetcar, are silent. But with the same technology used to create movie soundtracks, it is possible to experience what the city sounded like in 1906, when the bells were new. I'm trying to make people jump into the scene and live the scene. So I thought, well, maybe what we'll do is we will play a bit of the scene, look it around us, and see what we hear. This is only two blocks away from the Holy Rosary Bells, so have you tried putting those in? Well, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Notice how they're really audible over everything else. That kind of traffic didn't dominate like it does now. I mean, this is all on a very human scale. Watching all those people racing across the street it looks actually positively dangerous. Right. So they obviously are relying on their ears as well as their eyes to tell them what was, what was going on. The sounds are clear and distinct, and it isn't dominated by just one sound, such as traffic would be today. The point, according to Truax, is that cities have always been loud. But back in the day, it was a loud you could live with. Take a tour of Venice, and you'll hear what cities sounded like before the Industrial Revolution. Once you get away from the Vaporetto transit boats and slide into the narrow little canals called Rios, you hear what the world sounded like before internal combustion. Instead of gasoline and diesel engines, you hear voices and footsteps. But even here, sound has long had an uncanny power over people's lives. And as it turns out, people were constantly listening to their city, and this was, came as a huge surprise, that they were listening to their buildings, they were listening to the way in which the city talked to them in various ways. Art historian Neil Atkinson is fascinated with the way sound organized the workday. Long before radio, TV, and the internet, and even Holy Rosary in Vancouver, bells were a primary means of communication. Before people had watches, the sound of bells controlled their every waking moment. And it wasn't just the church that rang them. The big marangona that rings in that tower uh, that signifies that the dock workers have to be in the arsenale, or during the day, bells will ring to make sure that magistrates are in their council halls, that lawyers and jurists are in the courts. By the time that the bells finish, everyone has to be in place. So there's this kind of acoustic organization or choreography to the daily rhythms of the city. 
The same was true in other Renaissance cities such as Florence. Here, the city's first town hall had its own bell tower to rival the ringing from the church's main cathedral. The government's bell had to be the biggest and the loudest, big enough and loud enough from a tower high enough in order to establish their legitimacy and authority over the city. So what the regime was doing was acoustically trying to insert itself into the sounds that the Christian church had been making for centuries. But it wasn't just City Hall and the church that wanted to control sound. In 1378, wool workers who toiled at looms like these, who had no voice in government, launched a revolution by seizing control of the bells. Within a few minutes, eight bell towers around the periphery of Florence were ringing to signal and coordinate what turned out to be one of the first, if not the first, successful worker revolution in Europe. Having hijacked the bells, as many as 10,000 workers swarmed into the public square outside City Hall to voice their demands. And this is exactly what happened in Tahrir Square in 2011, when Egyptians gathered in the square who wouldn't stop making noise, who would not leave. The bells were the Twitter of their day. The sound of the crowd penetrated the walls of the palace, so much so that the government gave up. They came down, they handed the keys to the palace, and they literally went home. The people had finally won. Noise is a natural byproduct of human activity. So silence, or the use of quieter technology, has become a valuable commodity in our loud cities. From a distance, you can't hear us at all. You can't smell us either. Sheldon Wright out of Vancouver has created a landscaping company that works entirely without gasoline-powered tools. Back in the bad old days, we used to be covered in two-stroke, and you're in a wall of sound all the time and covered in dust. Um, now you're just covered in dust. At first, Rideout's new company did everything by hand. Then, technology changed. The electric equipment we have is all lithium battery powered, so we've almost got the Teslas of lawnmower equipment. This equipment does make noise, but only half as much as internal combustion engines. What I heard on a regular basis was, was we're so tired of the noise. We're tired of the smell. We're tired of our entire day being interrupted when a landscape maintenance company shows up. You're not going to get away from noise, but anything that can be done to reduce it, it just it helps with stress levels. What we're talking about affects everyone. Whether you say, oh, I can get used to it, it doesn't bother me, or something like that, but it always has an effect, both physiologically, psychologically, and in terms of communication. It's, in many cases, the soundscape that gives you a quality of life. But for one blind person, sound means so much more. Being able to navigate comfortably, nothing can be more fundamental to freedom. What if sound were your primary means of finding food? Your main method of survival? That's how it is for big brown bats. Bats are really neat animals, and they have to be able to do everything without relying on vision. James Simmons, a professor of biology at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, is setting up a maze of plastic chains. He and postdoc Kelsey Holm are testing the ability of bats to navigate with sound to help improve sonar navigation by humans. Bats are very comfortable flying through the branches and leaves of vegetation. And while they're doing this, they're looking for insects. And they're flying several meters per second. So the experiment uses a slow motion camera and simulates the bat's natural environment. So the way we thought to do this is to replace the vegetation with these black plastic hanging chains. You get something acoustically very similar to a whole field of vegetation. Because the sound a bat makes is beyond the range of human hearing, Simmons uses an ultrasound detector to convert the signals to a frequency we can hear. Simmons is particularly interested in how a bat's brain is able to process sound signals and perform complex mathematics at extremely high speeds. 
So the bats emit sounds and do lots of fast computations in the brain about the arrival time of the echoes coming from different distances. And the trick of sonar is to be able to do these computations quickly enough that you can see the scene before you emit the next sound. We can't do that with our digital computers because they're not fast enough. The fascinating discovery is that bats actually form 3D images based on sonar echoes. When we see something with vision, we see color and we see texture and lots of things like that, the sonar image that a bat gets of an insect is stripped down to only three or four body parts. The bat will aim its sound at the insect and get a bunch of echoes from the different parts of the target. But when it's chasing the insect, it doesn't go straight toward it. It follows a curved path so that each time it emits the sound, it's getting a slightly different angular view of the target. And by rotating this way, the bat gets to see the parts of the object in their real three-dimensional locations. Bats actually see with sound. Perhaps even more astonishing is the fact that some humans are able to do the same thing. So we've got a tree here. I'll turn here. By 13 months of age, Daniel Kish had lost both eyes to a cancer called retinoblastoma. Instinctively, he soon began to make clicking sounds and started to echolocate just like bats do. Those clicks you hear are from his mouth not the tapping of his cane. Big open area, but we're approaching a structure. He calls this flash sonar. Flash sonar has become Kish's primary means of navigation. So in my case, it wasn't something I was really aware of. It just happened as a consequence of my childhood experiences. I get an image that occurs in a 360 degree field. The roof structure we're under isn't totally solid somehow. It's got uh, openings in it, as if it were slatted or... I describe them as fuzzy geometry, moving, dynamic figures. They have depth and contour and character, and they provide me with information about location, density, and you can also kind of hear things around corners and you can hear things through objects. So, you know, it almost has this kind of omnipresence about it. As a kid, I was raised to think of myself as, as pretty unremarkable. My parents, their emphasis, their regard for me was you're, you're a kid like any other kid. He got his first bicycle at the age of six. I learned, I learned to click like a maniac and I learned to ride around the neighborhood. And if I ran into a pole, my parents just didn't make a big deal out of it. Running into a pole is a drag, but never being allowed to run into a pole is a disaster. Riding a bike blind has become a kind of stunt he does to raise awareness that the brain can adapt and that people can do far more than they realize. Fifteen years ago, it was just unheard of. So if you don't close your eyes for just a moment, okay, and you're going to learn a bit of flash sonar. Now, you have scientists studying it, you have instructors wanting to learn it, you have instructors wanting to teach it, you have blind people wanting to learn it. Being able to navigate comfortably in any environment, under any circumstances, nothing can be more fundamental to freedom than being able to do that. We asked him to draw a picture, to recreate from memory the image he got from nothing more than the sound of clicks. I'll just do a little dash line here. And remember, he had never set foot in this pavilion before today. And then we had another column kind of across the way here. Definitely taxing my artistic merits here. Should I say ta-da? Ta-da! The accuracy of the image is uncanny. It shows that there's an actual imaging process taking place you're using sound instead of light to create a picture. Okay, well, I was right about the roof. So humans can see with sound just like bats, but bats have an advantage. They aren't affected by noise. Back at Brown University in Providence, Professor Simmons explains that bats normally live in a very loud world. 
The sonar sounds of many bats are 120 to 130 decibels of sound. You have 50 bats all flying around in the same small space. All the bats in that space are exposing themselves to this intense sound. And they appear not to suffer the noise-induced hearing loss that follows that, something that we would normally suffer. And we need to find out what it is they're doing to protect themselves. In the course of a human lifetime, loud sounds cause physical damage to the inner ear. Tiny hair cells in the cochlea convert sound waves to electrical signals that go to the brain. The cells most prone to noise-induced damage are the ones that act like an amplifier for soft sounds. With hearing loss, people have cochlear damage. Those outer hair cells get damaged, so you lose the amplifier. Basically, you lose the knob for turning it up on your stereo system. But noise-induced hearing loss is only part of the problem. As we age, the brain's processing of audio signals slows down, making speech harder to understand. So it's not just a question of turning up the volume. Our auditory system is able to pick up little small gaps in speech. A common example is the word say versus stay. The difference between say and stay is actually a little pause right when the T happens. These are actually scalp recordings that we record through EEG. On the right here, we have a 16 millisecond gap, and it would be akin to trying to process the sound stay. There's a little gap at when the T happens. With age-related hearing loss, these gaps are harder to detect, so Ts and other consonants become muddy. So you can hear, you know, A, E, I, O, U, but you're having trouble with the consonants that are surround those vowels. At the University of South Florida in Tampa, scientists are testing a new drug that might help. In a study that began with mice, they learned that the drug can improve sound perception by stimulating nerve channels in the brain. There are little channels that process potassium. Nerve cells rely on the proper concentration of potassium. The new drug adds potassium to these sound processing channels. As you age, the number of these channels declines. The drug will increase the activity or the effectiveness of the remaining channels. We are ready to do some EEG testing. This is where we're going to... After the Florida team successfully tested the drug on mice, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved a phase two clinical trial on humans. What we're going to do is put this electrode cap on. He's going to listen to some sound sources, and what we really want to see is changes in the central auditory processing. As they screen potential patients for the drug trial, they're looking for people who have a hard time detecting those sound gaps who have a hard time hearing consonants and understanding words, especially in a noisy background. And whenever you hear that rare, high-pitched beep, I just want you to hit the space bar for me, okay? Because the drug is designed to make speech clearer, not louder. That would be the, the home run for this study, if it actually improved their ability to hear speech and understand speech and background noise. In the future, a pill may repair hearing loss, but sound is already killing tumors and may someday cure Alzheimer's. What we have found in mice can eventually be translated into humans. The future of sound even looks like magic. Sound waves from a bank of speakers can levitate solid objects. By focusing sound from opposite directions, researchers have created what are known as standing waves that can actually suspend objects in midair. Floating 3D graphics, microgravity, and drug research are some of the possible future applications. Sound has already transformed medical science when researchers at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston married an MRI scanner to an ultrasound device. Everyone knows ultrasound as the imaging tool for expecting couples. This team is using sound to burn away tumors, a form of surgery without a cut or a single drop of blood. So we're about to start the procedure. We're going to treat your uterine fibroid. By focusing the ultrasound beam into tissue, somewhat akin to the way we would do with a lens and the sunlight, sound waves will cause a local vibration 
of the molecules in the tissue. That motion causes local heating, and that heating therefore can kill the cells in that area. So the thermometry is the really key part that the MRI brings to this procedure that no other procedure, no other imaging tool can do. We're seeing in real time the signal intensity changes. You see how this area has become white, but that shows me that that's exactly where the energy is being deposited inside her fibroid. Once we get above 55 degrees C, the cells are dead. But this is just the beginning. MRI-guided focused ultrasound can take away the pain of bone cancer. There are clinical trials with prostate cancer and breast cancer and many more. The most exciting one right now that's in clinical trial is the one that's actually being used to stop intentional tremor. So intentional tremor is when patients develop like this, what I'm doing with my hand, and are unable to write or eat or feed themselves. And this technique, when targeted to the correct part of the brain, stops that tremor immediately. With this technique, they can now use a transducer around the head and allow the ultrasound enter the brain non-invasively. And that's leading to some very exciting applications. For example, in Brisbane, Australia, another form of ultrasound is being tested for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Jürgen Goetz and Gerhard Leininger set up an experiment using mice born with a gene mutation that produces the amyloid plaque associated with Alzheimer's. As naturally curious animals, normal wild mice will explore all three parts of a Y maze. But mice with Alzheimer's can't remember where they've been before and tend to explore the same area over and over again. Pulses of ultrasound gently open the barrier that protects the brain from infection, allowing a protein from the blood to stimulate waste removal cells that clear out the toxic clumps of plaque. We use pulsed ultrasound, and because it's pulsed, the tissue is not heating up. After the ultrasound treatment, when the mice enter the maze again, they're able to explore just as well as healthy mice. And the nice thing is, we show a restoration of memory functions. So basically, we are able to restore memory functions to what one finds in non-Alzheimer's mice. And I'm highly confident that what we have found in mice can eventually be translated into humans. So the sound we can't hear is curing disease. And the sound we can hear shaped our history, brings harmony to the structures we build, helps us navigate the natural world, and creates 